Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. In our last episode, we covered Alexander's travels into Egypt, his visit to the Oracle at the Siwa Oasis, a discussion on godhood, and we finished with the Battle of Gaugamela in the autumn of 331 BC. With Darius's forces utterly destroyed, Alexander effectively had conquered much of the Persian Empire. Darius was still somewhere in the east, though, having fled the field during the Battle of Gaugamela. And as long as he remained free, Alexander knew that a chance of Darius' return would only be a matter of time. But Darius and his remaining forces would have to wait. Alexander instead turned to the southeast, marching his forces to one of the most famous cities in all of the ancient Near East, Babylon. A welcoming party was waiting at the city gates for King Alexander's arrival, and he was taken into the city with honors and gifts. In a gesture of goodwill, Alexander ordered sacrifices in the customs of the Babylonians and vowed to rebuild the despoiled temples of the city. This was met with great fanfare, since the Babylonians had long viewed the Persians as religious oppressors. In a repeat of his last actions in Egypt, Alexander kept the Persian governor in charge of the political and administrative duties, but he left the financial aspects to trusted Macedonian officials. Leaving one jewel for another, Alexander turned towards Susa, one of the capitals of the Persian Empire. Inside the palace laid a vast treasury, amounting to a whopping 50,000 talents of silver, equivalent to 300 million Greek drachmae. In addition, some spoils from Xerxes' sack of Athens in 480 BC were also found and restored back to the city, with a decree that all of the cities of Greece were to be free of any tyrannies. The return art was a nice gesture, But the decree was basically a bold-faced lie, considering that the Macedonians themselves were effectively replacing the tyrants. Diodorus and Quintius Curtius report a scene in Susa, where Alexander placed himself upon the oversized throne of Darius. Given his shorter stature, he requested something like a booster seat for his dangling legs, aptly given in the form of a table. Upon seeing this, one of the Persian attendants had wept, and when Alexander asked why the tears, The eunuch spoke of how his devotion to Darius grieved him when he sees the royal furniture now being used in such an ignoble manner by a Macedonian king. Before leaving Susa to pursue Darius, Alexander received an additional 13,000 infantry and 1,500 cavalry recruited from Macedon, quite a substantial force given the army size of around 46,000 prior. And in the winter of 331 to 330 BC, Alexander marched east from Susa towards Persepolis. To reach it, he had to pass through the land of the Uxioi in southern Iran. The Uxioi were an unconquered mountain tribe who demanded a toll payment from Alexander in order to allow him to pass safely. Instead of a toll, this was repaid with Alexander and his troops storming their village that night and killing many men, women, and children in their beds before they could even awake to the carnage, and sold the rest into slavery. Ouch. With that issue settled, Alexander then reached the Persian Gates, a narrow passage that funneled movement through the Zagros Mountains leading into the area of Persepolis. Having sent much of the baggage train and heavy infantry with Parmenion to travel along the famous Royal Road, Alexander sought to enter the pass with a companion cavalry, some light infantry, and some light cavalry. Things seemed to be going pretty smoothly, But little did Alexander know that a force of Persians, led by the general Ariobarzanes, were holding the pass and were waiting in ambush to halt the king's progress. The ancient sources give a number of 10,000 to 40,000 soldiers to the Persians. And while this has been accepted by much of the historical consensus, there is a growing trend that indicates that this is a vastly exaggerated figure, given only the recent destruction of the Persian army at Gaugamela. These newer opinions tend to cite a figure of only a thousand or so. It is understandable that many of the propagandists of Alexander would certainly try to hide this blemish on his nearly spotless career, and it is rather surprising that Alexander would get caught in the trap like this. He either didn't bother to scout ahead, which seemed unlikely, or the scouts were killed. But in any case, the Persians set themselves upon the Macedonian column and badly mauled it casting missiles and rolling boulders down upon the terrified Macedonians, who managed to retreat after much carnage. 
but they had to disgracefully leave the bodies of their comrades behind. In anger, Alexander then made a plan to surround the Persians in a pincher movement. He and a number of men took a hidden pass at midnight, while Philotus turned south. At the break of dawn, the Macedonians descended upon the Persians, who fought valiantly to their deaths, in an image not too dissimilar from that of the Spartans at Thermopylae, with reports that even the sister of Ariobarzanes had fought bravely along with the men. The entire affair was a near disaster for Alexander, and it cost him roughly 5,000 men and set him back one whole month. Now, having cleaned up this last pocket of Persian resistance, nothing lay between Alexander and the city of Persepolis. Persepolis, literally translated to mean City of the Persians in Greek, and the Persians themselves referring to it as Parsa, was one of the great capitals of the Persian Empire. Its true purpose is not entirely understood, but since its foundation in the reign of Darius I sometime around 515 BC, it had been occupied seasonally by the great kings for primarily religious and ceremonial reasons. It wasn't as big or politically important as the other capitals of Susa or Ecbatana, but it was lavishly decorated with absolutely gorgeous reliefs along walls of stone, enormous statues and carvings, and contained vast sums of money and treasures. Alexander entered the city in early 330, and what happened remains one of the most infamous events of the entire campaign. Our sources, as ever, are split on the question of Alexander at Persepolis. The Vulgate accounts of Plutarch, Diodorus, and Quintius Curtius are relatively consistent and present a story of a morally degenerating Alexander. In this tradition, after looting much of the treasures in the city, Alexander and his companions were all having a symposium, a drinking party in the palace, celebrating their victory by getting drunk, while surrounded with scantily clad women. One of the ladies, an Athenian named Thais, beckoned the ear of Alexander, and convinced the king that burning the palace would be a brilliant way to strike back at the Persians for their past sacrileges. In the heat of the moment and the wine, the citadel was set ablaze, but not before Alexander recovered his senses, and realized that he was destroying one of his new toys, and in vain tried to put the flames out, but to no avail. The other story, put forth by Arian, demonstrates a more calculated and deliberate Alexander. Against the recommendation of Parminian, who thought that the burning of the palace would disgrace Alexander in the eyes of his Asian subjects, Alexander willingly ordered the destruction of the complex in revenge against the actions of Xerxes and his raising of Athens in 480 BC. Arian paints a picture of a remorseful Alexander, but still goes out of his way to point out that the action was uncalled for. The question is, who do we believe? Well, my interpretation is that Arian's account is probably the most accurate. It is worthy to mention that Arian, following the count of Ptolemy, is missing any mention of Thais, who just also happened to be the mistress of Ptolemy, and it would be convenient on Ptolemy's part to avoid mentioning anything involving him or her in a bad light. But, in my opinion, it is more productive to look at it from a more pragmatic point of view. The whole purpose that bound the League of Corinth together, besides the whole crushing of the Greeks with Macedonian military genius thing, was the invasion and punishment of the Persians for their transgressions during the Greco-Persian Wars. We've seen Alexander pragmatically destroy the cities of Tyre and Thebes, and in the case of Persepolis, he was fulfilling the obligations to the League and completing its ultimate goal set out. Evidence of the ruins of Persepolis today show signs of fire damage and cracked stone, suggesting vandalism or purposeful maliciousness, because it would be done by heating up the material before suddenly pouring cool water or liquid onto it to weaken the foundation, and there is a lack of any sort of small treasures or goods in the archaeological finds of the site, unusual given its wealthy location. And the sack of Persepolis would yield a vast collection, even larger than that of Babylon's, between 50,000 to 120,000 talents of silver. But the legacy of its destruction would continue to affect Persian attitudes throughout the centuries. In the 5th century AD Zoroastrian text, Arda Wiraz Namag, Alexander is referred to as Alexander the Accursed, as many of the famed Zoroastrian scrolls were incinerated in the burning of the city, and he would be hated by the Sassanid shahs of late antiquity. <laughs>
Following the destruction of Persepolis, Alexander sought to continue the pursuit of Darius, who was rumored to have been in the capital of Ecbatna to the north of Persepolis. But marching there in the summer of 330, Alex discovered Darius had already fled to the interior of Medea. Before he continued, Alexander decided that, with the mission of the League of Corinth fulfilled, he paid off the Greek allied troops with generous wages and allowed them to go back home, offering to take any as volunteers if they wished so to serve. Parmenion was also ordered to be sent north into Hyrcania, along the southeast coast of the Caspian Sea, along with the treasure to deposit in Ecbatna. And so, Alexander, with a small collection of forces for speed, pushed to find the great king, and settled near the city of Ragai after days of pursuit, in order to get some rest. A member of Darius's camp, named Bagistanes, entered the camp of Alexander, bearing the news that Darius was currently arrested in a coup performed by the commanders Bessos and Narbarzanes. King Alexander immediately called for the horses, and sped off with only some scouts and the companion cavalry, and made a mad dash for two whole days. He met up with the Greek mercenaries who had refused out of loyalty to take part in the coup, and they signed up with Alexander to save Darius. Reaching the Persian camp after traveling 40 miles in one night, the Macedonians put to flight much of the entourage and killed several Persian soldiers. Despite their great efforts, it was too late. Out of fear of retribution, Bezos had plunged a javelin into Darius and tossed him aside in retreat. The more dramatic telling has Alexander have a final heart-to-heart -heart with Darius while passing the throne to him in his dying breath, and the other has Darius quietly asking for a drink of water from a Macedonian who found him, and upon receiving it, he thanked the young man and died. He was 50 years old. Alexander, upon reaching Darius's corpse, took off his cloak and covered him, and sent his body to be given a royal burial in the remains of Persepolis. The last Shahanshah of the Achaemenid house, dating back 230 years to Cyrus the Great and the foundation of the Persian Empire, lay cold among the soil of the Iranian Plateau. An ignoble end to noble beginnings. Unhappy with the fact that he could not capture Darius alive, Alexander sought to punish the rest of the traitorous retinue, especially Bezos, who had taken the tiara and royal trappings, proclaiming himself the successor of Darius. And so, the journey continued north into Hyrcania, into Iran south of the Caspian Sea. But I'd now like to take a pause on the narrative and give a small aside. With so many events with vast distances and large-scale events being covered, I haven't really had time to talk about the day-to-day -day life while being on campaign, or the internal politics of the Macedonian army. The competitive nature of the Greeks, as author J.E. Lendon put it, was rar in the Macedonians, who engaged in bouts of athletic prowess in Olympic-style contests, chariot racing, mimicking the acts of Achilles and the heroes of the Iliad, and the winners were rewarded with wreaths and special favors by the king. Lendon points out that Alexander used this competition to keep his troops at peak performance and morale, something especially difficult given the remote locations they often spent months at a time at. One of the favorite pastimes of Alexander and the rest of the Macedonians was hunting, where in one famous incident, Alexander just narrowly avoided being set upon by a lion, but not before spearing it and making an excellent mosaic relief about it, which has been found in the excavations at Pella. Of course, there were camp followers, your stock standard blacksmiths, leather workers, and doctors, but also entertainers, prostitutes, slave traders, and businessmen looking to buy booty. Often, the soldiers' wives and lovers taken during the campaign would be following along as well, something that would be disastrous in the crossing of the Gadrosian Desert some years later. The court of Alexander was surrounded by poets, philosophers, and general sycophants, who composed panegyrics to flatter the king. With such a motley crew surrounding Alexander, it is little wonder that absurd stories like Alexander meeting an Amazonian queen and engaging in a several day long bloodmaking session, a story which, when told to an aged Lysimachus, made him comment on its comical nature by wondering where he was at the time. Keeping the common folk of the army together was one thing, 
but trying to balance the politics of the inner circle of the Macedonians and the back of Macedon was a difficult task. Alexander was a prolific writer of letters, communicating back and forth between his various governors and officials, and particularly from his mother Olympias and Antipater, the standing regent in Macedon. Olympias and Antipater never got along, and that's putting it mildly. Usually, Antipater would complain to Alexander about the machinations of Olympias, and Olympias complained about the lack of respect by Antipater. She also repeatedly pestered Alexander about various things, to the point of the king claiming that she charged a high price of rent for nine months in the womb. In the camp, the companions were often generously treated by Alexander, being given gifts and praises and for rewarding bravery. Over time, the men of Philip's generation, men like Parmenian, Clytus the Black, would be nudged out of the way by the men of Alexander's generation, Hephaestion, Ptolemy, Perdiccas, Craterus, Lysimachus, and Eumenes of Cardia, and these would be raised to prominent positions. As victory led to plunder, this rising circle began to become accustomed to the vast wealth generated, and Alexander even mused that he could scarcely believe that these were the sons and grandsons of goat herders, with all the finery and goods that they were accumulating and flaunting. Despite their collected fondness for their king, all was not well in the inner circle of Alexander, as rivalries and hostilities had begun to take root, something to be expected when money and wealth comes into the picture. Some companions had become jealous of the treatment and standing of others, particularly that of Hephaestion, who was the king's utmost confidant and promoted to a very high command post, despite himself being a relatively mediocre officer. Probably the clearest infighting was between Hephaestion and Eumenes, a Greek secretary and close friend of the king. They at one point had gotten in such a beef with one another that Alexander had to step in and rebuke both of them, threatening to kill them if they disrupted the harmony of the army. The most fractitious event, however, took place in the autumn of 330. Philotus, son of Parmenian and commander of the Companion Cavalry, was considered a rather arrogant and uncouth figure, prone to boasts about his own greatness while diminishing that of Alexander's. Accusations of untrustworthiness were reported as far back as Cilicia and Egypt. Suspicious? Certainly. But Alexander would cut him some slack, given his long relationship with Philotas, and honoring the long service of Parmenian. This would not last, though. A Macedonian named Dimnus had confessed to his lover Nicomachus of a plot to assassinate King Alexander. Nicomachus then told his brother Cabalinus, who then fled to the tent of the king, where on guard was Philotas. He informed Philotas of the great and imminent peril Alexander was in, and Philotas acknowledged it, assuring that the king would be informed. The next day, with no word from the king, Cebalinus again pressed Philotas to hurry up. You'd think an assassination plot against your longtime friend and ruler would maybe prompt you to, you know, at least tell him about it. But Philotas seemed to be in no big hurry, and he said he would get to it when he could. Out of desperation, Cebalinus ran to Alexander directly, and informed him of the plot. Enraged, Alex ordered Dimnus to be arrested, but couldn't get a confession out of him before he had committed suicide out of fear. Alexander and his companions concluded that a figure of low birth and rank like Dimnus could not have acted on his own initiative, instead assuming that a higher ranked figure was using Dimnus as a pawn. Firm on his decision, Alexander ordered the arrest of Philotus. Philotus was interrogated and tortured in front of a small assembly of Macedonians, while Alexander himself listened behind the curtain. Philotus vehemently denied the accusations, and Nicomachus could name many other members of the conspiracy, but Philotus was not one of them. What had doomed Philotus then was his admission of hearing the plot against Alexander's life, and despite visiting the king's tent twice a day, he failed to make mention of this. Philotus insisted that he did not feel that the threat was anything to worry about, and that's the reason why he never told the king. But the abandonment of his duties and endangering the king's life had led Alexander to sentence Philotus to death. 
in the traditional Macedonian manner of a volley of javelins. In hearing his cries for mercy and relentless sobbing, Hephaestion is told to have remarked that if Philotas was as weak and unmanly to sob like a wretch, then it was curious how he could have involved himself in such dangerous business. In an act of Machiavellian wisdom, Alexander made another difficult decision. Knowing that the death of Philotas would eventually reach his father, and though he felt that Parmenion was guiltless of Philotas's crime, there could be no loose ends. Sending two officers across the desert by camel to outrace any messengers on horse, he had Parmenion assassinated in the land of Media at the age of 70. What would be known as the Conspiracy of Philotas was a dangerous event to the structure of the army and has been hotly debated in academia. Biographer W. W. Tarn calls the whole affair a black mark on Alexander's reputation, and classicist Ernst Badian proposes a thesis that the whole event was a way for Alexander to eliminate the House of Parmenion. In this theory, many of the biographers of Alexander had undermined much of Parmenion's military brilliance, who had served very capably under Philip II and had operated on his own in Asia Minor before Alexander even left for the Asian campaign. Parmenion was also extremely popular with the soldiers and hired mercenaries, and it would be to the benefit of Philotas if Alexander happened to die, so it would make sense that Alexander would be threatened by the potential power of Parmenion. What better opportunity to implicate the last surviving son and kill Parmenion as a side benefit? But I think this goes too far, and I lean more towards the views of Professor Waldemar Heichel. Alexander had quite the reason to have Philotas executed, the loss of his own life and the crumbling of the army. The reasoning was that this was a long-term political machination by Alexander is not really straightforward, because the amount of trust that Alexander had placed in both Philotas and Parmenion throughout the campaign seems to disagree with the whole notion. And while the murder of Parmenion was wrong, there was no other way. It is doubtful that Parmenion would have taken the execution of his only remaining son lightly. Rebellion and the fracturing of the army would have been inevitable, and Alexander had to make the final decision, one that was out of his hands by the time the javelins pierced Philotas' body. It had been a trying year for Alexander since his victory at Galgamela. While his success had never been greater, cracks in the stability of the army had started to emerge. The murderers of Darius were still giving Alexander grief, and though his pockets were filled with vast amounts of Persian wealth, it would take more than just silver and gold to deal with his next trials. Before him lay the arid wastes of Parthia and Bactria, in modern-day Afghanistan. It is there that he will have to face the great nomads of the steppes, and also face more dangers lurking within. Thank you all for listening and your support of the show. If you want to hear more, please subscribe to me on iTunes and leave a review, or you can follow me on Twitter at HellenisticPOD. Links and sources used will be provided in the podcast description. But until next time, this has been the Hellenistic Age Podcast. <laughs>